You're listening to the Visible Expert Podcast, where we share stories, research, and actionable insights to help B2B marketers and practitioners drive extraordinary growth in their professional lives. Thank you for tuning in to the Visible Expert Podcast. I'm John Tyerman. And I'm Kelly Waffle. And today we are joined with Daniel Burris from Burris Research. Our managing partner, Lee Fredrickson, actually sat in on the interview today. So that was really fun to get him in, and I thought it was a very insightful conversation. I thought it was chock full of goodness. <laughs> and Daniel is a uh, well-renowned speaker. He's uh, one of the top three business gurus in highest demand as a speaker, um, I thought it was really, really cool. He shared his insights from his book, The Anticipatory Organization, which you can get for free. Just pay for shipping at vaobook.com. So go to that uh, URL and get your free copy. So Kelly, what was one of your biggest takeaways from our chat with Daniel? I've got so many here. I'm looking at my notes. Um, He really looks at the world a little bit differently than a lot of us, and he's been doing it this way for decades. So... The world, in his mind, is just continuing to change and is uh, not slowing down. And um, some of the things that uh, I walked away with that he talked about was um, you can either be disrupted or you can be a disruptor. It's really up to you. But one of the things that I thought was really cool that he talked about, even though you know he talks about um, how to look at trends and be able to uh, use those to predict your future a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, and that's really what that book is about, uh, the model he creates there. But he really talks about um, determining what your gift is, and I thought that was really a neat point, is everyone's got a gift, you just need to figure out what it is, and then use your talents around it. And um, I, I thought that was a, quite a, a great positive message. What did you uh, pick up from that? My biggest takeaway was, you know, you you read online about agile marketing and how that's um, one of the kind of a hot trend today in the marketing world. Daniel argues that being agile is just being reactive. It's not being anticipatory or proactive. Um, the, The way that he framed that, I thought, kind of struck a light bulb with me. That really kind of got me thinking a little bit differently, so I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it's very powerful. It's really around finding certainty in an uncertain world Mm -hmm. and how, from a business point of view, you can use that to your advantage. Um, It's just really well thought out. Well, let's spare no more time and get right into our interview with Daniel. And as always, this podcast episode is brought to you in part by the Hinge Research Institute. If you're involved in marketing demand or lead generation and want to use a data-driven approach to content strategy, consider using original research. The Hinge Research Institute offers a range of services from tiered sponsorships of original studies to custom research on specific industry challenges. And we found that high-growth professional services firms are three times more likely than no-growth firms to using original research in their content strategy. And, according to Forbes, Companies who adopt a data-driven approach to marketing are six times more likely to be profitable year over year. So if you're interested in learning more, email us at research at hingemarketing.com and we'll find the right approach to using original research for you. All right, and now for our interview with Daniel Burris. Our guest today is Daniel Burris, CEO of Burris Research. Daniel is considered one of the world's leading futurists on global trends and innovation. The New York Times has referred to him as one of the top three business gurus in the highest demand as a speaker. Daniel is a strategic advisor for executives from Fortune 500 companies, helping them to accelerate innovation and results by developing game-changing strategies based on his proven methodologies for capitalizing on technology innovations and their future impact. His impressive client list includes companies such as Microsoft, GE, American Express, Google, Deloitte, Procter & Gamble, Honda, IBM, and even the Pentagon. He's also gone on to create uh, online learning systems uh, such as the Anticipatory Leader 
and has also segmented out those learning systems for the accounting industry and has been recognized by Accounting Today for his efforts there. Also, Daniel has founded six businesses and written seven books, including the Anticipatory Organization. He has been the featured subject of several PBS television specials and has appeared on programs such as CNN, Fox Business, and Bloomberg, and has been quoted in a variety of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Fortune, and Forbes. Wow. Daniel, welcome to the Visible Expert Podcast. Hey, it's my pleasure to be with you. Daniel, here at Hinge, we define recognized influencers who freely share their expertise in the B2B and professional services spaces as visible experts. Uh, Some might call you a visible futurist. And this podcast is really focused on sharing the stories of our guests and bringing to light the challenges and rewards they encountered as they built their personal brands and their expertise. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a visible expert and a visible futurist? Uh, yeah, I sure can. Well, I, I have, as you mentioned, I've started uh, six companies. Uh, five were profitable in the first year. Four of them were national leaders in the first year. The first one was in the aviation business. I had my own airplane design. And uh, uh, it's, so in other words, I don't just write and consult, but I actually uh, know how to start a business and grow it rapidly and, and so on. My main company, Burris Research, has been in operation now 35 years. And we uh, research global innovations and in technology around the world in all areas. And uh, again, I've written thousands of articles and seven books that I'm happy to say have been bestsellers and uh, do uh, quite a bit of keynote speaking around the world, as well as consulting, as you mentioned in the beginning, with not only with the big companies like the uh, Googles and the uh, IBMs and the Deloitte's, but also with the mid-sized firms, helping them to uh, really see and find certainty in an uncertain world. And if you really want to go back to the dawn of my time, I started out teaching biology and physics mm-hmm. before starting my first company. And I mention that only because I'm a research guy. And so all of my principles I'll be sharing on this podcast are all based with uh, a good uh, research and have proven themselves. Well, that's uh, uh, that's really good to hear because that's... Uh, Hinge's background too, and uh, myself. I started out as a psychology professor, so you know the. Uh, oh, great! Yeah, you, you'll you'll have a lot of uh, resonance here with our audience. Um, a question that we get a lot from people who are uh, trying to increase their visibility and trying to increase their their uh, visibility of a specific expertise. Sometimes they kind of uh, you know they. Uh, uh, are not sure what they should be known for, you know, which part of their expertise they might might have interests that uh, cover a wide range of topics. You know, how did you decide about what you wanted to be known for? How did it happen for you? Was it something organic or did you do an analysis and say, this needs to be my area of focus? Yeah, well, that's an excellent question. Really important for people because... I, uh, a lot of times what people do is chase the hot topic and they decide to be an expert in that hot topic, the topic at the t- of the moment. Trouble is time goes on and that hot topic might turn cold. So what I really would like you to what I like our listeners to do is to really dig inside themselves as to, first of all, where do they have credibility and expertise already? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and what are they, uh, are they really the most interested in? Uh, and, and here's a really a key, what is going to be increasingly more important as time goes on? So if you go back to when I launched Burris Research mm-hmm. in 1983, remember we, wow. that, that was the year the first Mac came out. I mean, you know, there we were, that wasn't even, uh, there were no modems, and there wasn't even a hard drive in your computer yet. Right. Uh, so it was so, that long ago. And ball, yeah. at that time, I know. So at that time, I knew with full confidence and certainty that technology was going to continue to play a, uh, a bigger and bigger role in how we live, work, and play. 
and it would redefine our uh, our world on us many, many multiple times, and it would get more and more confusing, and the pace of change would continue to accelerate faster and faster, which means if I could help people figure it out and find a way through that and find opportunity, I would be increasingly in need as every year unfolded, which has held up now for 35 years. So now, is that the only thing that can do that? No. But what I would like you to do is realize that you're either going to be less relevant or more relevant in the future. You can't be in the middle. It's kind of like right now, if I look to all businesses and all individuals, you are either going to be the disrupted or the disruptor. There Mm -hmm. is no middle. And frankly, I'd rather be the disruptor. And let me just take a second on that since I'm kind of brought up the subject of disruption. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, most people see disruption as negative. And the reason is that's because it happens to you. And now you got a crisis managed, put out fires and, uh, and uh, try to keep up. But Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, does he see disruption as negative? The answer is no. It's all the people he's disrupted that see it as negative. Mm-hmm. In other words, I would like all of our listeners on a personal level and also to empower their organizations to be positive disruptors, creating the disruptions that need to happen. Why? Because most of our systems are not all that great anyway. And there's a lot of wasted time and there's a lot of wasted energy and a lot of repetition where we're not using our human skills to their best. That's why people get bored. That's why people don't like their jobs. So what I'd like you to do is to be positive disruptors and look at the new tools that exist and what we'll talk about in a few minutes, the hard trend certainties that we know will happen as we go forward. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that will help you to be more relevant. And you asked a very big question there. That's why I gave you a, a pretty good sized answer. And because you mentioned you were a, a psychology professor, um, which is fantastic. Uh, I believe that if you change your mindset, you change your results. Mm-hmm. And I don't have the right or the ability to tell you what to think, but I can change how you think about the future and how you think about opportunities and uh, and that can can help. So with that in mind, one last thought, and that is everyone listening to this have multiple talents, but you can only go so far with the talent. But you, I also believe that everyone has a unique gift. And what happens is we make our money on our talents and we get good at it, but we reach a plateau and then we start coasting. And most people coast their way through their career, which is more difficult in today's world. But if you can determine what your true unique gift is and direct the talent to support the gift, you will find the thermal that will allow you to soar rather than having to flap your wings all the time. Yes. Well, we we know there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time flapping their wings. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, there there is. How how would you go about... Uh, finding your gift, what what does that mean? And how would a person who's listening to this figure out, well, what is my gift? How do I think about that? Well, most of uh, what we tend to do is take our gift for granted because it's our gift. And it's, uh, and hey, can't anyone do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so the people that probably know your gift the best is not you. It's probably someone who is very close to you, or maybe a best friend, and it's a conversation about, uh, you know, and so that, that can help you to uncover it. Secondly, ask yourself, <clears throat> going all the way back to when you were a kid, um, when you were experiencing extreme satisfaction and joy, and you didn't even know what time it was, and you enjoyed doing what you were doing so much, and it was very satisfying, what is it that you were doing? And uh, that thread probably goes through your life as a tapestry. And if you can think of what that thread is, uh, that can help you. So those are just a couple of things. I don't want to get uh, too deep into this because we could make an entire podcast about that. But, but I think what I want everyone to take away from this conversation about gifts versus talents is that First of all, no, everyone listening has a true gift. 
And I believe part of your life's journey is to discover what it is. And, uh, and you don't look for something you don't know you have. So I'm telling you, you've all got one and it's worth looking for it because you're more likely to find it if you bother to look for it. There you go. Another, you know, another question I have is, you know, many people have a pretty good idea of what they want their focus of their expertise to be, but they're struggling with how do I make myself visible? How do I make that expertise visible? What, what do I do now? You, uh, you're someone who's already made it. You've got, uh, you know, a busy schedule and, uh, a high profile speaking and consulting and best selling books. How did you get there? How, how did it start? And what would you tell somebody who's starting today? Well, uh, let me just take a, a journey that I uh, started back uh, not that long ago, uh, but around 2009 or so. And that is, I was a uh, uh, I was part of LinkedIn. I was on LinkedIn. Like probably most of the people, we are, we use LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. And I realized that as a social media, uh, that is the really the biggest uh, social media for business. Because Facebook is designed for individuals and so on. But that's a business social media platform. And I decided to start uh, writing uh, one article uh, every week and, uh, and to, uh, but, and a lot of people uh, kind of think of it as a blog. I started Mm -hmm. posting, but most people that write blogs or write an article, whether it be on LinkedIn or anywhere else, they just keep pumping it out. But I did something different. I looked within the first few days as to how many people were reading it and how many people were commenting about it. And, you know, I noticed that some, had maybe uh, 200 readers. Some had 30,000 readers within the first couple of days. And now here's the point. I thought they were both good articles. Obviously, mm-hmm. others didn't. So what's the difference? So every time I wrote one, I learned from it and modified. And I started to learn, you know, what are the, what are the unique elements to a title? What are the unique elements to the first paragraph, et cetera? And today I've got uh, 1.3 million uh, connections on LinkedIn. I'm in the top 30 in the world. And more importantly, ever since 2010, I've been driving uh, way into the six figures of income every year for over a decade off of just LinkedIn alone. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's become quite a moneymaker. Now, remember, I started out with one follower. So when you see somebody with 1.3 million, in the top 30 of the world, you thought I could never do that. Wait a minute. Remember, I had 10 at one time. I had, I had 20 at one time. So it's a journey, but learn, grow, analyze. And, um, and what did I write? Well, I write things that help people. So if you're sharing the kinds of things that are insightful and help people, you know what? More people will share. It. More people will learn. That's why I've got uh, also a big Twitter following and, and I think I have a couple of million blog readers and uh, on a on a monthly basis. So because I got syndicated. Well, that all just when you again, look at someone like me, that's already where a lot of you would like to be. I'm saying there's a journey and the key is get on it and start writing. Uh, one last little comment. I've got a, uh, a nephew that uh, graduated from college and is trying to uh, you know, really get that great job. And I just said, look, start. Nobody knows that you can think. Nobody knows your thoughts. Nobody knows you're a sharp person. All they know is what your grades show uh, when you were in college. Start sharing your thoughts. Start writing and developing a following. And now you've got a body of work. And by the way, that costs nothing. Mm-hmm. So there is a way to get started. Mm-hmm. When I, by the way, when I started my business 35 years ago, and I've been very blessed to be in high demand all those years, uh, I spent uh, a year doing very deep dive research on global innovations and technology because, again, I was already interested in that. Uh, remember, mm-hmm. I, I taught biology and physics. So, see, that was already part of my DNA. And I was also interested in the future impact of an innovation. So I did a year's worth of research before I ever gave my first speech. 
And I did a huge amount of research to really come up with what am I going to share? Where is the future going? Is there any way of seeing it? Any way of making it visible? That's, uh, in other words, is there a way of being a visible futurist to use your kind of your tagline there? Yes. And I found a way to do that by, and now I can get into what I talk about in my uh, latest book, The Anticipatory Organization, and that is all trends I found are either hard trends based on future facts that will happen, or they're soft trends based on assumptions about the future that might happen. And once you learn how to separate those two from all trends, and you can find the future facts from the future assumptions, all of a sudden you find certainty in a seemingly uncertain world. So as a leader, as an individual, uh, it's hard to really make a bold move uh, because there's so much uncertainty. But Mm -hmm. when you can see how much of the future is indeed visible, and you will learn to become a visible futurist yourself, saying, wow, look at all the certainty, it's amazing, then you can be the disruptor because you can see the disruptions coming before they disrupt, giving you the choice. You can see problems that people are going to have and you will have before you have them so you can pre-solve them. That's being anticipatory versus being agile because agility (laughs) is reacting quickly after disruption occurs. Agility is reacting quickly after a problem occurs, which is good, but what I find organizations like much better is anticipating versus just reacting. And of course, that's what I'm trying to get people to do. Yes, yes. Uh, That's uh, an excellent point. I have one other question just on the the process of becoming that expert. You know, uh, one of the things that uh, people often question is what's the role of other experts here? Uh, you know, and we've found a lot of times that uh, w- part of the way you improve the quality of your game is by interacting with other experts. I, I'd like to understand what your view is about interacting with other experts on these kinds of topics. Has that been helpful or not Not so much for you? Well, it has been, um, I would say it's kind of helpful. And uh, so, in other words, uh, here's why I mention that. And that is, uh, if you really want to soar what you in your career, a couple of things you need to do. One, you need to have a unique spin. You need to come up with something that's yours. You need to give birth to, to a concept. Because if all you're doing is sharing other experts' concepts, uh, it, you will be lower on the totem pole. If you really want to become visible, you need to develop your own way of, of analyzing and looking at whatever it might be, you know, whatever your subject area might be. So if you're in accounting, uh, you know, and you're, or you're in construction or engineering or whatever field you're in, um, you know, what is, you need to develop your unique angle on it. And that takes some time. It takes some research. Heck, I told you, I, I researched for a year to come up with, you know, uh, my way of a unique angle that has still served me well 35 years later and has been, you know, growing every year. So it takes some research. The other thing is every day be learning because if you want to earn, you got to learn. And that's where I am not looking necessarily at other, in my case, as a technology futurist. I didn't look much at what other technology futures were doing. I looked at what's the new technology that's being developed. Mm -hmm. Um, I did, you know what I mean? I didn't need experts to tell me that because most of them were all looking in one little narrow area. And I wanted to look again, my uniqueness is I look at, uh, at the uh, genetics and I look at robotics and I look at AI and I look at cybersecurity. So I'm looking at the entire world of that rather than one focus area, which is what most do. Plus, I came up with, again, this hard trend, soft trend methodology. So I continue to learn. I I read every day. I'm learning every day. And by the way, I write every day. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I put it in my my calendar. How did I write seven books when I was delivering 
you know, for 20 years, I gave a hundred keynote speeches a year for 20 years. And now I backed it off to more like 70 or so, but that's all over the world. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm a 2 million miler on three airlines. So, but wow. what am I doing in those? You must have an incredible flying? jet lag kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, well, jet lag is actually more psychological than anything else, but that's another subject. Um, uh, but what, what I would really say is it's an office. Where do I read? Where do I write? And when I'm home at three o'clock, I'm going to write every day because that's a good time for me. Now, maybe it's eight in the morning for you. Maybe it's noon. Maybe it's 10 at night. Find your time, make an appointment. Matter of fact, somebody did an interview for me not long ago and they said, what's your most important piece of software? And I said, it's my calendar because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I'm going to exercise, I better make room for it or it ain't going to happen. If I'm going to write, I better make, I better put it in there. And by the way, I want some blank space in there for just spontaneous stuff, but I better have that in there or I won't have a vacation or I won't do that either. Right. So I think we got to have a little, you know, <clears throat> failing to plan is planning to fail. Mm -hmm. Speaking of failing and planning, uh, what is the implication of your anticipatory? And as I said, I'm a fan, read the book, and I think there's a lot of great things in here. Well, what are the big implications for your approach for the planning process for uh, professional services firms and B2B companies? Yes, and as you mentioned uh, a couple of years ago when I launched the anticipatory organization learning system, uh, an anticipatory leader learning system, and then later came up with the book uh, This uh, more recently um, around this teaching people how to be anticipatory. There are four key elements to it, and the first is transforming, not changing, but transforming how you plan. And that's where you learn how to define and separate the t all trends, because well, frankly, there's no shortage of trends. The real problem is which ones are going to happen and which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. So by separating them, learning to separate them into the hard trends, the future facts from the soft trends assumptions, all of a sudden you start to get some clarity. Another insight I'll give you that comes out in the book, uh, but I'll share with everyone, is that a trend by itself, frankly, I think is boring. Who cares? It's when you tie it to an opportunity that it bursts into life. So when you identify a hard trend, uh, or even then you look at so what's the opportunity in that hard trend, or you identify a soft trend, what's the opportunity to influence it in a positive way? So to give you a quick example, let's take a look in the United States at the increasing cost of health care. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going up, 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 up. Been doing that for a long time. That's called a trend. Well, is that a hard trend, meaning it's a future fact, unstoppable, that will continue to rise, or... Is it a soft trend that if you don't like it, you could change it? And the reality is that's a soft trend. You can change it. But if you think it's a future fact, all you do is figure out how to pay for the mess the baby boomers are going to cause as they get older. Mm -hmm. But if you realize it's a soft trend and you could use technologies like blockchain to create transparency and trust and more security in a system that has no transparency and high cost, you could flush billions of dollars out of it. You could use virtualization and uh, other new interesting tools to transform, not change, how uh, purchasing and list logistics is done within uh, hospitals. And you could flush out billions of dollars. In other words, you could change that or not. But knowing that you can change it is a key, and there's opportunity in that. Or another quick example is, uh, we have uh, so many people retiring right now from organizations, taking their knowledge and wisdom with them. And I would say, well, actually, you got two trends there. Got to be careful. First of all, the hard trend is you've got baby boomers retiring. Mm -hmm. The soft trend, the soft trend, taking their knowledge and wisdom with them. You could do something about that or not. You could develop, you know what I mean? You could do mentoring, you could do all kinds of things, or you could let them take it with them. You see what's hard and what's soft, what is changeable and what's not, and you start to get some certainty. So, and and the uh, one of the parts of the anticipatory organization is learning to do that. Secondly, there's a, uh, out of the four, the second section is how to transform innovation. And that's you, now that you can find these hard trend future facts, you can actually innovate with low risk. 
because if you don't do it, someone else will. It's right there in front of you. You know it can't. If it can be done, it will be done. And now you can see what can be done. And the real it shifts risk as an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, because now you can see the real risk is in not doing it. It's kind of like either you're going to be the disrupted or the disruptor. What do you want to be? And then the third part of it is uh, how to transform culture, and that is creating a anticipatory culture that is using change to its advantage and really seeing that if you're changing a process a product or a service you're falling behind but if you're truly transforming it that's how you jump ahead with low risk and the last section of the book and the learning system is uh transforming results and that's where you learn how to skip problems so you can learn faster and go ahead farther and uh and so on so there there are these all these tools, and that's I think why the Pentagon is using it for uh, for their learning system. And uh, I'm an advisor; I'm the only non-military guy in their futures group, as well as other companies and accounting firms that are using it. Matter of fact, you've got a lot of accounting firms listening. Let me give you a quick example: a mid-sized accounting firm that uh, got the book and the learning system. Um, they looked at the future, and they saw that their clients which were uh, small and mid-sized companies in this case, um, they were going to increasingly have cybersecurity issues, but the, they weren't really dealing with it. They weren't really coming up with and working on it because they were small and mid-sized firms. They're talking about mm-hmm. their clients. Yeah. So what they did is they decided to acquire, and by the way, they could see it was a hard trend that would, cybersecurity is going to be an increasing issue. So they acquired a startup cybersecurity firm, and within the first 12 months, it became the most profitable part of their company. Um, And uh, now it's uh, it's a national firm. Uh, I mean, now that part of their company is dealing with company. uh, They're not regional anymore. Now they become national. They Mm -hmm. did some other things, but I'm giving you a quick example. One last little quick accounting example, although I could give you many because I have many accounting firms that are using the anticipatory organization uh, for accounting and finance. That's a special version we have. And that is in the in accounting, we tend to charge and by the hour. And by the way, a lot of firms do this. Take a look at engineering and construction. We have an hourly Indeed. rate. That's what we charge. But so let's just Talk about the visible future about that, the hard trends. And that is technology is letting us every year do far more with far less because we're automating so many different functions. In other words, if you are charging by the hour, you're going to make less every year because you can do more in less time and your client, your customers know it. They don't want to pay for all that. So we need to be doing value-based billing if we really want to have bigger margins, if you look at the exponential rate of technological change. But instead of saying, well, we got to shift immediately from billing for time to billing for value, uh, that would be another mistake. Because one of the things I teach is the both and principle versus the either or. The both and principle says it's a combination of hourly billing and value billing versus either one or the other. So the key is you need to learn how to do value billing. You don't just start. You haven't even done it before, or maybe you're doing it a little bit. And you need to start transitioning. And, of course, that's where, as accounting and uh, auditing and the other services, we're going to all go and be more on the consulting end because technology is going to automate a lot of the other part of it. And that's where our true value will be. It, so yeah, accounting nice firm, thing. engineering, whatever it is, value-based billing is your future. But you see, this is why I loved you so much, Daniel. I'm uh, just telling uh, John and Kelly here, here because uh, it, the we just finished a research study on how the accounting firms can implement value billing. So uh, you see, I love you guys. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, All right. And where can, yeah. and where can they learn about that? Where can they, cause I want them, everybody listening to this, I want you all to read that. Where can they get access to that? It'll be, it'll be coming out shortly and they can hear about it in hinge 
we'll be announcing. All it. right, make sure you do. All right, so I'm recommending everybody get on that because uh, that's a key. And another interesting thing, and you may want to think about doing something on this as well, is the structure of a firm. Most of the uh, accounting and engineering and construction and others consultancies tend to be a firm. Mm -hmm. And the problem with the firm as an organizational model is that the, uh, uh, the partners want, uh, you know, they, they don't want to, you know, spend a lot of money on innovation. They'd rather at the end of the year, put it all in their pocket. So where's the budget for really transforming your business? Where's the budget for really getting outside of the box and investing? And most of the, the firm partners are getting older and would rather just say, look, I just want the money. And But the problem is that cash cow is going to be harder to milk if you don't transform your firm. You need to invest. So the, the firms that are really going to be thriving in the future are the ones that are becoming a 21st century model of a firm that is actually investing and seeing the value in making sure that firm doesn't become obsolete because either you're going to be more relevant or less relevant in a world of exponential change. And the very nature of the firm is helping you to be less relevant unless you do something different. And I'm urging all of us to have a partner conversation about how do we increase the relevancy of the firm by accelerating innovation and not just doing what we've always done. Look, right in the beginning of the book, because you read it, Lee, you know what I wrote. Why did, uh, didn't did the taxi driver think of Uber? Why didn't Marriott think of Airbnb? And the answer is they were too busy doing what they've always done, period. Mm -hmm. So if all we do is do what we've always done in the past, we could thrive. We could do fine. But from this point going forward, if all you do is what you've always done, you'll have much less of what you've always had because the world's changed. Your customers are changing. Have you noticed? Indeed. Hey, uh, Daniel, I've heard you say that innovation has to become every, everyone's job. <clears throat> Why is that? And can you give us an example of what you mean? Sure can. Well, in the learning system in the book, there's uh, two types of innovation that normally aren't taught that I've got tools and I teach. One of them is called exponential innovation. That's where you take a giant leap forward with your innovation. But normally, firms and companies don't like to do that because it's got high risk. But when you learn to separate the future facts from the future assumptions, and you can see with full confidence uh, the disruptions heading your way, and you can see that if you don't do it, you're, you're, someone else will, and you're going to get disrupted. You can actually do exponential giant leaps with low risk. Because, again, if you don't do it, someone else will. You can now see the future because you become a visible futurist. Now, to answer your question, the other kind of innovation that most people don't understand is what I call everyday innovation, which is something that all individuals can do. And that is by becoming anticipatory. And the way you do that, a simple way to do that, is you get all of your people empowered to predict problems. How many times have you, or you as a listener, said, I knew that was going to happen? And I'm going to say, so why did you let it? You see, when we implement something or we're trying something new, you're saying, I know that's not going to work, but you let it happen anyway. You go ahead. Or you hire somebody and you know they're not going to be any good, but you have them for two years before you finally let them go. You know, but by the way, one of the things I like to do is fail fast so I can learn faster. So, um, so what I'm getting at is everyday innovation is empowering people to look for predictable problems that they will have in their function or in their role and pre-solve them so you don't have them in the first place. Because... You're either a brake or an accelerator. And so what's slowing innovation down? What's slowing our firm down? What's slowing our progress down? And a problem, by the way, is going to slow you down. Well, most of your problems that you're going to have a year from now, frankly, you could predict right now if you took the time and pre-solve them. Or you can let them play out and get bogged down. I would rather pre-solve. Another thing I teach along this line to innovate is... Uh, you know about postmortems. 
Right. And a postmortem is when you implement something, uh, a new process, a new service, or whatever it is, and then after it's implemented, you do a postmortem to see, well, what went wrong, what didn't work with our implementation, et cetera, et cetera. Well, as if you're an anticipatory leader, if you're an anticipatory firm, what uh, you do is you do pre-mortems and you meet with the people that are going to be using it, even if they're customers, and you go through all the things that will make it fail. And you pre-solve all those problems before you release it. That's why shortly after releasing our learning system, uh, Accounting Today gave us a Product of the Year award. Why? Well, because we did a pre-mortem before we ever launched it. We already had solved all the problems they were going to have using it. Let's be anticipatory, not reactionary. How many, and of, the, how that, many of the problems that empowers were you able to solve before you released well, it? In, uh, in other words, how effective was it? Uh, it? Did you get all of the problems, most of them? How did it work out for you? It was amazing. I got to tell you, it was amazing. We really didn't end, uh, encounter problems. There were people who were, I mean, when I say that, it you would say, yeah, he had to, hey, this got to be he's blowing smoke. I'm, I'm not. It works. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable how it works. And uh, because what we did is we actually cherry-picked companies like on the in our accounting version of the learning system uh we picked people from mid-sized companies small companies ceos uh from and as well as the big ones the biggest of the big four and we got them to test it for us because uh, they were excited about what it could do if it worked and we got what they liked and what they didn't like we fixed it got it back to them they tested it again and said i can't find any problems and by the way what did they all do they endorsed it and got it for their companies. They liked it so much now because they were a part of the process. I mean, that's pretty slick. Mm -hmm. um, it is. We can do, we can all do those types of things. You see, I'd rather anticipate. I'd rather pre-solve. Let me give you another thing that uh, I mentioned very quickly and uh, earlier, but it's big. And that's part of the learning system. And that's under the accelerate success. And that is how whatever problem you've got, that's not it. There's another problem. And the key is learning how to dig down to find the real problem, which is fully solvable. So that's another thing that I know is that when someone says, I've got a problem, or if you have a personal problem right now you're dealing with, I'll tell you right now that it's the wrong one. And there's a way to peel the onion back to get down to what the correct one was so that you can truly solve it. So that's part of that pre-mortem is to really make sure you're solving the correct problem, not the perceived problem. There's a lot to this book. As you know, you read it. Yeah, and uh, it's not just one thing. And it's really what I'm trying to do, as I said earlier, is I want to change how we think without telling you what to think. I want you to not just be a fast reactor and to put all of your efforts into being the most agile firm and the agile individual. Because that still is reactionary. And the world is not slowing down. Actually, in a month, it's speeding up. And that's a hard trend. Because technology is continuing to evolve at an exponential rate. And with that in mind, you need to become far more anticipatory. And that's why I'm excited that you had me on this podcast. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, let me just stay right now. I know that your listeners are going to like this book. So much, I'm going to give them free a hardcover copy of this book. If they go to the T H E A O book, that way you don't have to put in anticipatory organization, the A O book.com, um, there's a place to sign up and you'll, I'll send you now. You got to pay for shipping and uh, it's not, I'm not making money in the shipping. I know I'll, you'll get you a hardcover copy of that book at no charge. And by the way, why am I doing that? Because you know I don't get books for free. And the answer is I'm doing it because when somebody reads it, like you read it, Lee, uh, you become a fan and you recommend it to others. And you, they end up buying it at Amazon and I end up doing fine. So theaobook.com, I am an author that believes in this book so much, I'm going to give you a hardcover copy. I don't care how many do it. Well, Daniel, thank you so much. I was actually just going to uh, plug your book there, and you beat me to the punch. So if, uh, if folks want to download your book, they can go there to theaobook.com. If folks want to learn more about you, where should they head? Uh, they should go to Burrus, B-U-R-R-U-S.com, 
And you can find a lot of resources. My blogs are there, and there's all kinds of resources and things that you can learn, and as well as a number of video links. So that'll take you to just about everything you want. All right. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on our show. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Pleasure working and speaking with you. And I love your uh, visible expert uh, handle that you have. Uh, and I think uh, the key is learning from others. And you provided a great model for that. So thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate your time. This was fantastic, Daniel. Thank you for your time. <laughs>